So, I'm not quite up to playing yet here with Grand Seacal, but I'm getting closer and closer. Uh, you know, obviously, as I did the rules and everything, I had the board set up. I had most of the pieces that I'm planning on having present set up. I took the first step, which is essentially transcribing the information contained on these, some of it, and in the scenario, onto these sheets for each of the players. Now, theoretically, each, character, each country could have a photocopy of one of these, or the original, if you really, you know, like destroying your games. Um, this has a lot of information about the countries and would be useful. It also has some places where you'd put some things. Now, the thing is, some of that information is stuff that's kind of running totals, and some of it's just little notes that, you know, are going to be useful for one turn. Uh, so as an example, well, public debt. This is a constantly changing value, but it's associated with the country. So you kind of, uh, like an EU, want an economic sheet of some sort, and that's what's keeping track of this. Some things change a little less, which uh, corresponds more with the cards that I used in EU. I, I use some rather large index cards to keep track of, you know, what the monarchs are, what the, uh, what the size of the different army status was, all kind of stuff that changes throughout the game, but kind of slowly, unlike, say, the treasury itself. And a lot of this is stuff that changes rather quickly. And stuff like that would include the uh, structure of the company, um, the structure of your fleet. But <sighs> I'm not quite sure how to handle you know, this game yet, which is why I'm using just scrap and haven't done anything more uh, permanent in terms of cards. Maybe the second time I play it, I'll uh, play with cards, although who knows when that'll be. I have too many damn games, it seems. Um, some of the information that's on here does give at least the death dates expected for the different leaders. I haven't figured out how you find out whether the next leader is under age yet. I'm hoping to be able to understand that at some point um, within the game. Certainly, uh, there's got to be, you know, some kind of link here, uh, but without some date link to it directly, and maybe there is one in the annexes, I don't see how that can make any sense. Because for example, you know, when you're going, uh, oh, I don't know, in, in some cases you've got a brother taking the throne or something. So it's not like the, the heir is always going to be a minor that you could use some kind of calculation to make a fair guesstimate of when they should uh, arrive at the throne. Um, anyway. Uh, information here that's kind of important that I had to decide on. So one of the, uh, the biggest decision that I had to make right off the bat before I set up my pieces, because in particular, I can't set up the trade fleets until I know what the rules are here, uh, based, is based on the policies that the different countries select. It doesn't really help you to decide what order that you're supposed to decide this in. I assume it's just all done secretly before you set up the pieces. So, uh, Spain is stuck with an exclusive and Poland stuck with free trade, but everybody else has a choice. They can take any uh, policy that they like. Um, so England chose an exclusive. Now the reason for that, let me just go into some of the thinking, was none of the colonial territories does this matter for? Those are all going to be free trade until, you know, say I gain uh, Quebec and New York, which are linked here, or if I gain New Orleans and, I don't know, something. <laughs> I can't really tell for sure uh, by those lines, what connects to what. Um, it could be that these two require the entirety, but that's not what the little lines there seem to represent. So for example here, spice comes from these two. Well does that mean that uh, Manila doesn't produce spice but it produces gold? Is that what's being linked there? I, I can't really tell uh, from the description of the rules and what's going on. So anyway, uh, for the English the only two that they have real control over are the manufacturers and tissue. And when I looked at my little sheet 
I said, well, manufacturers I get three bucks each from, tissue I get only two bucks each from, but if I set an exclusive, I can send one fleet into each of those and guarantee that I'm gonna get that cash. Now, I tax that cash, so my national treasury is gonna get a buck each, but I'm gonna also be pocketing for my company treasury the money for that, and that allows me other fleets to do other things. Other people were not as extreme. So Austria took a tax, that's kind of iffy, in their hands. Um, as a matter of fact, I think they'll be revoking, they'll be changing that uh, to free trade. They have no real reason to be taxing because they have no commerce. So, you know, I just looked at, hey, tax is cool. I don't need exclusive because I don't have a, a company, but there's an advantage to free trade, uh, which is only that you can give land grants but that gives you more leaders. And if you're not gonna have a trade company at the beginning of the game, and if nobody's interested in uh, trading with you, there's no reason not to go free trade because there's no penalty to it. Russia took an exclusive. Why the hell would they do that? Okay, well, that's a good question. I think they'll go free trade as well. Um, my thinking with them probably was along the lines of, you know, someday I may gain uh, a commodity like uh, the iron up here, which comes from here. But you know what? I can expend a prestige point if it's an important thing for me to actually uh, start a trade company. Right now I don't have a trade company. Uh, and I don't have the territory, so why don't we just forget about that for now? Go with the free trade, take the military bonus there. Prussia took free trade for the same reason. France took a tax policy. They have things that maybe they would have wanted to have an exclusive on, but when they looked at cereal, wine, uh, these weren't very valuable on their particular sheet. Now, maybe they are to other people, though. They don't have a whole lot of merchant ships. So cereal is worth two. Uh, this isn't much better than, or much worse than the English wine is worth. Oops. And, uh, you know, they're figuring as well, if somebody else wants to service those, I'm not too opposed to that, and I'll take a buck out of it without even having a ship there. Now, it's only government money, but I can use my shipping in order to uh, service some of these other uh, locations. But what's not clear is where these lines go. So for example, this line, where does that go? Is that all three colonies? Then why are these, you know, distinguished differently? What's going on precisely here? <sighs> Damned if I know, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just not clear what the lines are meant to represent. I think when there's multiple lines, um, they're representing that there are specific locations that they come from, but it doesn't make sense. For example, slaves would be coming from all of these locations. Uh, so there should be three lines then. Uh, all right, so when you combine the, the kind of unpolished rules and probably un incomplete rules with designations on the map that don't really clearly express what they're they're trying to maybe say either the game becomes troublesome and we know this is going to happen it's an awe game obviously i do find this a lot less clear than uh europa universalis though there's no question there some of it it may be that parts of the rules are still in french and inaccessible to me to some extent although we have puzzled out uh some of that all right, um, some of the other powers here. Well, we talked about France. Poland's stuck. Uh, Spain's stuck. Holland went with a taxation policy, largely because I wasn't sure about this. They may actually want an exclusive there. Let's look at Holland. And change everything, right? Uh, spice, see... They actually kind of like their stuff here, too. They have manufacturing and tissue and spice. They can't control this one. And slaves that they can't control and sugar they can't control. Um, spice they have a three on, manufacturing. Sugar I don't think they have a bonus on. They don't own the, what looks like the entire 
tea of anything or any scent there. Um, <clears throat> but tax means even if I lose uh, the competition for the resources, I still get to provide the resources to players. So we'll take that, see if, you know, the English with their exclusive are beaten out by the Dutch with their tax. I don't know. It seems like exclusive is the way you want to go, though, if you're not going free trade. It, it, tax seems like kind of a bad compromise unless you don't have the shipping to produce. So yeah, we'll go to exclusive with them as well. I think they can make more money that way. Just rethinking and guessing here. Uh, Sweden's policy is tax. They have a couple of ships, but they're not interested in what they produce. So they're figuring if somebody comes here and sails in here, I can get the buck each. Now for them, it's a hard choice because they actually have uh, some desire to get involved in a military operations in a way a land operations in a way that England and Holland probably don't um, but so free trade might be a better choice but they need capital because one of the things based on this track here this is the national debt well Sweden has no national debt but they also have a small treasury and their money their revenue is not terribly large either, only 11 and a half. That's all charted out here. The scary public debt, Spain with 40 and Turkey uh, has 25. Turkey only makes 14 and a half plus two with no real uh, revenue gain. Uh, Turkey went with free trade. The only thing they have is this cotton here. You know, they're figuring nobody's gonna go with that and they won't need the military bonus uh, pretty well. Oh, Russia has a big uh, debt, right? Let's see where they are. No, Russia, I think that's a 15. Yeah, 15 debt with uh, only a 10 plus two resources. Uh, Poland has a, a big problem numerically. 10 buck debt, only 10 and a half revenue. Uh, these things are scary. Um, not terribly so, but remember you pay 20% of your debt in interest each turn. So that is somewhat troublesome. All right, that's just some thinking and some ideas there. Uh, pretty soon I'll be starting, I guess. So the first step in setup <laughs> is, hey, I gotta pick a country that's gotta set up first. Now, um, there's no way to discern that from the uh, prestige alone. The guideline then says go to a random choice. So what I did was I threw all the uh, country counters in here. These are the army counters or whatever. And we picked France first, so they have to set up first. I don't see a different way of resolving this. Maybe I'm missing something in the uh, French, but anyway. Uh, my next choice is, okay, where do I want to put my trading fleets? Because there my thought was already in place. And when I look at France's purchases, I see things like, oh, art is worth four, slaves are worth four. Ooh, spice is only worth three. Did I take any? No, I didn't. Sugar, cotton, these are all worth four each to the French. So they have a lot of trading capability. Now they don't want to go places where they're not going to have free trade because they're placing first. In a sense, um, this is kind of putting your marker down on places. So for example, by putting their place into uh, Venice, now Venice becomes less valuable to anyone else who goes there. Um, alternatively, of course, they could have thrown themselves into Turkey for cotton. I think Turkey has free trade going on. Uh, but there's no real advantage to doing so. I grab things over here um, in the New World. Given my general positioning towards the New World, you would think I'd want my fleets more in the New World uh, facing it, but I actually put them in the Mediterranean because I can't really oppose the guys who are likely to be over there, the Dutch, the English, the Spaniards. I'm just trying to trade freely. Uh, we've got a little bit of a potential problem in terms of Spanish privateers because one of our goals, our victory conditions um, for this scenario, 
not the grand campaign, but for the scenario, involve uh, what uh, the Franche Comte, Artois, and I think Lorraine are the three that I want to get control over. Now, Lorraine would be the easiest to do so. I could just launch a preemptive strike on Lorraine and hope nobody comes to their defense. Uh, but given that Spain has two of these and I have a, a well, I have a free Casas Belli because I have claims to these. So it doesn't really make sense that I also am specified as having a free Casas Belli on the first turn of the game against Spain. But, you know, whatever. Uh, I think because I have claim. I, I mean, actually, I'm not sure about that. Claim just gives me a normal Casas Belli. Anyway, I'm taking advantage of that and setting up in an anti-Spanish sense. Uh, so the units that I already picked out before I'm putting out on the board, and you can see I've got kind of a positioning uh, to put myself at war with the Spaniards. I figure my, pos my position vis-a-vis -vis Spain is actually pretty good. Um, I have a public debt, but it's only five, whereas Spain has a rather large one um, of 40. So all the odds are kind of in my favor. Now, my leaders aren't assigned yet. I've got uh, my king, Louis, who gives me a statesman bonus, and I've got Colbert, who gives me actually a military bonus, which seems a little strange. I would think, uh, oh no, that's a naval bonus, man. I'm sorry, uh, who gives a naval bonus, which will help my uh, companies. But I don't really want, I, I want to win the, uh, <coughs> the war and hope that I can get it over before the scenario is done because I've got some victory points for getting those territories. I may want to make a move against Lorraine at some point. In fact, all these units here in Alsace are kind of weird. Um, my military leaders are not positioned yet. And this guy's a naval leader. It's hard to see. But I know the name, and so I need to look. Uh, <laughs> they're not placed. I get one of them for free once I go to war, and then the rest go in the cup with other leaders. Um, by then, I'll have to dispose of these chits in there. Anyway, uh, that's kind of the thinking behind their setup. And every country, and there's 10 of them in here, is going to have to make that kind of decision. And, I, you know, I mean, for like the Russians with their feudal troops, if they're planning, if there's any chance they're going to go to war, I'll move their feudal troops off the map uh, with the intention of just bringing them back on at that point. But since I've already selected them, I don't really want to have to go through that process. It was kind of a painful one, looking up all the provinces where things are and whether or not I can have them and which ones are best. Uh, you know, we'll see what we get. I still haven't figured out how I'm gonna link the scenarios together using the Grand Campaign scenario. Uh, so for example, this scenario goes from 1661, I think to only 1666. And then the next one starts in 1672. Basically, uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to extend this one out to the beginning of the next one in terms of, although it's not, you know, part of the game, uh, in terms of uh, getting the victory conditions which are kind of skewed towards what you should be doing in the game overall. I'm not sure that, those make a lot, that it makes a lot of sense to do it that way, but that's, that's what I'm handling right now. Uh, in addition to everything else I have on these sheets, I'm going to have to have a space for victory points. That's going to grow quite large. In fact, you know, I should have like a whiteboard or something with all this information up there. I'm beginning to run into some problems in terms of setup here. So, for example, uh, Savoy, yeah, they control the three provinces, I think. But Venice does not control Croatia here. Oh, no, that's called Illyria. Yeah, it looks like a separate province, but it's part of Illyria. Uh, but Pomerania here, I can't find anyone who controls it. It looks like it's part of Prussia's home country, uh, but it's not listed in their initials. It's not listed in the additions for the scenario. My feeling is it's probably part of uh, the Hanseatic League at this point, so... <sighs> You know, in, in the sense that most of the Hanseatic nations have kind of disappeared, but things like Hanover and stuff are kind of part of that. 
and it may still be uh, neutral now. I thought the Swedes had grabbed it, but I look under the Swedish holdings, and it's, again, neither under the holdings that are listed here, nor uh, their advantage, which is simply illusory. It may be, uh, there may be a mistake there. All we've got here is counter errata. The other errata is, I think, all of a different type. <sighs> I'm not sure what to do, but I know Swedish troops have it. And if we look in later scenarios, let's see if the Swedes get it. Because they should have it at some point. Early in the game. So I'm thinking it was just left out accidentally. Yeah, I'm thinking it, it was left out accidentally and we should include it under their territory because they have troops with it. I think by now they actually hold Pomerania. I think they get it as part of their 30 years of war holdings, but I am not absolutely certain of that. Anyway, that's what I'm gonna go with because I've got troops in the Swedish based troops that come out there. Now, after about, after about 1710 or so, uh, Sweden becomes much less impressive. So this is the Polish succession. And this starts in 1717. Sweden should already be pretty much defeated here. Uh, we've lost a couple of territories. I'm not sure they should have Pomeranian those either though, because they do leave, lose it to Prussia at some point. And maybe it's meant to be Prussian territory, but again, I don't see it there. Damned if I know. For players to kind of place down their markers, had safe places to put them. Obviously, the French kind of claimed the best stuff for themselves, but other people could make more money, they figured, by putting in lesser valued to them places rather than competing directly. But as we see where things end up, now with the Dutch, they've started competing with the French especially, but also the Spaniards in certain areas that they're interested in. And they're willing to pay taxes to the Swedes up here for iron and wood. Just because their values for these commodities are particularly high. So if they get to keep them, they get three bucks instead of uh, the four that they would normally get. Now Sweden has a tax policy, so that generates money for Sweden. That's always a concern. Do you want to generate money for the person who's, you know, who controls the resource essentially, if they have a tax policy in place? Well, yes, you do if you don't mind them getting their share of the money. Uh, but here, well, these are four point areas and my choice was between placing myself in two point areas that maybe gave money to someone else, like I think wine, if they took wine from France. France has a tax policy, I believe. Uh, I couldn't place it in the Spanish one because they have an exclusive. I mean, I'd be allowed to. I just, it would be a bad move because I could not take profit from that. Um, so then, you know, there was the choice of, well, who do I go after? Do I go after the cotton here, the slaves up here, or do I go after the cotton down here that are worth two? The problem with taking a two-point area is not every power values things the same. So, for example, the Dutch are interested in wood and iron, which are things, say, Sweden's not interested in. So they'd rather go for the things that are more valuable to themselves on the, without really knowing where other people are. Uh, on the chance that uh, other people will probably compete in certain areas. Now, given that England, Holland, and Spain have all gone with exclusive um, trade policies, that means nobody's allowed to play in their world anyway. So, you know, this tissues, this is not going to get used. Nobody's going to go into that. Uh, maybe Holland wants to go for that. They get a guaranteed two, one of which goes to themselves. That may make more sense uh, than, say, taking, well, the spice is worth something to them, is it not? They have an exclusive on that as well. Uh, so maybe this cotton down here, this is quite far uh, from 
where they, they've placed a couple of navies to help protect their shipping. Nobody else has done this yet. So putting this here, you know, maybe somebody else will go into that cotton or, or something. Until I get kind of a feel for, you know, what all the other powers have, instead of zoning out on all these charts and trying to figure out, you know, I have an opportunity to move ships if I don't like where they are. Not that many, but the Dutch at least have the opportunity to move three of their ships each turn. So if they don't like where they're set up, they can shift some of them. And here we are, I think, at the end of setup. I'm going to load this up after this. Uh, <clears throat> for the English, they were the last of the shipping companies to go. And they had some pretty tough choices. For one thing, uh, they did fill their own because they get the best income off of them. And they, because they have the exclusive, they also, uh, and nobody's gone in there, and they get uh, some reduction. They also filled up some of the French territories. Uh, that's an advantage to France. That could be a problem in the long run, but right now uh, they got slightly better odds on that. Uh, they eventually had to go in here where they're looking at, you know, an expected value of one and a half for a ship, right? Basically, that's what you do is you, you look at your value here, how much you can make off a sh ship if it was to win. So here they would get three if it wins, but they only have, uh, you know, a 50% chance. So that's one and a half. If they put two ships in there, uh, then they would get two thirds of three. So the two ships between them would have an expected value of two. But since there's two ships, the expected value of each ship is only one, right? <laughs> so you got to make that kind of calculation and, and decision on there. And it's really not too hard once you start seeing, you know, once people have started playing stuff, going last is kind of an advantage in the sense that you know what your values are. Of course, uh, people might move their ships if their values are not terribly good. But uh, not a lot of competition. The French ended up losing their last couple places. We're kind of letting, well, the Dutch and the Spanish, they have their exclusives in those areas. The way I'm reading this is because there's more than one line, it's not the whole area. And, you know, I'm not sure about gold out of, uh, out of uh, the Philippines, but I'm pretty sure there wasn't a whole hell of a lot of gold coming out of Batavia and Canton. Well, to tell you the truth, I don't know. I mean, maybe this is meant to be for the entire thing, but I'm giving the Spanish their exclusive on there. It's, it's really not uh, terribly clear. I may take a peek at the rules and make sure that that is the way that things, that there's no counterindication to what I'm uh, saying there. Fleet-wise, the English have the most naval, uh, the most combat fleets. So they've exceeded what the Dutch have here, putting, f uh, actually they're even in Europe, but they put an extra fleet down here in the new area, in the new world, and they actually built an army, I think that's legal, uh, down here uh, in Massachusetts, ready to take New York. The Dutch could have put one of their mercenaries in there to help defend it. Of course, historically, they basically didn't defend it. Oh, Stuyvesant gave it up with very little uh, effect. Now, those, do they have forts in them? I know they have a naval, uh, a military port in them. I don't remember if they consider them as forts. I have to look that up as well. I'll be back a little bit after I check a couple more rules. I can't find anything on the forts, so I'm assuming that I'm mistaken about that vague sort of semi-memory. Uh, there was something that bugged me that's still present here. And now I forgot that as well. <laughs> this is really tough to approach. Uh, not to say that the English rule games, uh, a couple of them that I've approached in the, in the past, the, the Europa Universalis, Le Grand Guerre, these were really tough to, to start as well. So, you know, it's just, uh, some of the nature of the game there. Um, once you get a kind of an approximation of the rules, then you can play with that and then you can start fiddling with it and trying to look things up and figure them out. But until I've played it, I'm not going to have any feel of what, you know, I'm screwing up as it were. Uh, one... Mm, 
Ah, yes. One thing that was bugging me a lot is in the scenario, this starts in a general peace turn. Now, what that means is this first turn could take 20 years. Game-wise, that first scenario lasts only until uh, 66. It lasts a total of six, uh, six years. 61 through 66. Uh, that does not seem reasonable. Um, so my feeling here is the first turn is going to be a one-year general piece, the first turn of the scenario. That's not specified in the rules anywhere, but it, it makes sense to me uh, to put it in that position. And then, you know, that means if anybody does declare war on this first turn, uh, and we're set up for war on this first turn, really, with these preliminaries, at least the game will have some flavor. You know, if you played the singular scenario and the first uh, turn took more than six years, which is more than likely, um, there would be nothing of interest happening. Even if people declare war, it may just never happen. Um, so I'm interpreting that that's what they meant at the beginning of scenarios. It's a general peace turn, but it's only going to last one year so that if we get a war and if we were playing singular scenarios, that's what we would get. So we're ready to roll, and I'm going to load this one up, not because, geez, I've used up a lot of time, because damn knows we're going to... Uh, we're going to play a lot. There's going to be a lot of video as I struggle my way through this game. Um, but because I feel like I've reached sort of a milestone here and I'm ready to actually start. <laughs> All right.